Welcome, everyone, to the African American Museum and Library. I'm Kate Schultz, the Museum Project Coordinator, and today, wow, today is a very special day because I have a very special guest. As you know, I've been collaborating with Ms. Dixie, the founder of Unsolved Heroes. With this exhibition, actually, we opened in December with the exhibition. And actually, we're supposed to go till the end of Black History Month. But by popular demand, we are still having this beautiful exhibition here. And today, we are honored to have Mr. Curtis Morrow. Not only is he an artist, he's a photographer, the jewelry maker. And speaking of the Buffalo Soldier, oh my goodness. He's going to tell you all about his experience and everything that you hear today is going to be recorded and you'll be able to share it with your friends because we will upload it to YouTube. And it becomes a, a part of the archives department here at AMLO. Now, before I really get into Mr. Morrow, I want you to tell you a little bit about AMLO. AMLO, African American Museum and Library at Oakland. We are a research institution for African American history and culture. We have four departments here. We have a library. The library has over 16,000 books on African American history and culture, which does not include a rare book collection. And the rare book, the oldest one that we have is, I believe, 1802. And it, the author is not an African American. However, he is a Navy captain. And he talks about an African American who is actually. Uh, he calls them the cook. I like to call him the chef. <laughs> you know how that is, okay? So with that in mind, when, when you come here, and if you want to view any of the rare collection here, you can, we allow that. Um, however, we issue some white gloves, and some of you might know why we issue white gloves, and those of you who don't, it's because the oil's in your hand, okay? will help to deteriorate these books that we have, the paper, uh, faster than what they're already uh, being uh, uh, stored. Now, when you store it, it is a process. When you're storing documents and photographs, it has to be in a temperature control environment. And here at Elmo, People don't know, there's a third floor and our collection is stored on the third floor. However, we have offsite, um, two offsite storage units, which are temperature controlled as well. So the rare book collection is stored here, but artifacts collection that we have pretty much are stored off site. So, that gives you a little bit of insight of the AMLO as a research institution. Now, the archives department has actually over, I believe now we have uh, over 161 collections, uh, including Ron Dillon's when he was in Congress for 23 years. We have um, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, part of her collection is here. We share her collection with Mills College. We have the first African American school teacher in the Oakland Unified School District, which is Ms. Ida Jackson. And we have also the legendary Motown designer, Henry Delta Williams, his collection here as well. He designed outfits for uh, beautiful designs for Martha Reese and the Vandellas. Uh, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, Dinah Ross and the Supremes, and of course, the Jacksons and Michael Jackson. So those garments are actually a part of the collection here. And let's don't forget the legendary cartoonist, Maury Turner, creator, creator of the Wii Pod. So you see that 
of preserving history here is our mission, African American history and culture. Today, with Mr. Morrow here, becomes a part of the history of this institution. And that's why the staff here and, and myself, we were just excited to know that he was going to travel here to be in person so we can talk to him and meet him and have him here for generations to come in our archives department. So, Mr. Curtis Morrow, I'm just so excited to see you here. I mean, we're just like, you know, you're a celebrity. Oh, you, you, you are a gentleman of celebrity. Before we really get into your your history, the history that you're going to share, with me, um, this segment is like up close and personal type of thing. And uh, what is it that's, first of all, you have you been to Oakland or Bay Area before? Yes, I've been here on one, well, two occasions. The first time, you know, we had to run out. But the, I could say really one. And that was in 1983, I believe. And that was for an exhibition year. I was doing group. And uh, it was dreamer. And then we had Tom Healy. I don't know if you heard of that. Yeah, I heard of him. Yes, yes. And uh, Eugene Redman, at, he was, I think he was, uh, yeah, he was teaching at Sacramento. So they invited us here for that exhibit. And, uh, and that was my, yeah, that's the answer to the question. Yeah, that was the first time. That's your first, first time. But you know, we have hundreds of people here that was in the Korean War. Fact, here in Oakland? Yes, ma'am, right here wow. in Oakland, San Francisco, and also LA. You know, there's California. Yes. And, but I didn't know this, of course, until after. You know, like doing research. And, well, I don't know if we have got there yet, but yeah, but this yeah, time but, was yeah, 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 yeah. So when you arrived this time, Oakland, uh, were there any changes in Oakland that did oh, you notice? Because you know, we're talking but from 1983 yes. to now. Yes. 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 I mean, it's fantastic. Well, I guess that applies to everything. It's just, it's just. Now, what does Mr. Morrow do when he's not creating this beautiful art? What do you do? How, how, do, you, how do you, this painting actually make you relax? Yeah. Or do you do something other than that? Well, you know, I don't know. Well, every morning I usually do about half an hour of yoga. You know. Yoga? Uh, yeah. I picked that up in Ghana, too. But the question came up is how do Africans walk miles <clears throat> and carry 50, 80 pounds on their head, right? And a baby on their back yes. without tripping or stumbling. Yes. And so uh, I was told it was because of the breath control, because, you know, they breathe properly. And they always, you know, they are erect. Yes. All Africans. And, uh, so and that same yoga. person is so, yeah, so fun about how to, you know, so that's one of the things that I do. I picked up the breathing, the proper breast control there. And uh, since I retired, I just added on to, you know, some scratching and, you know. So that's why you look so good. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you good. Now, uh, one last question. What's your favorite food? <clears throat> I mean, do you have a special, when you wake up in the morning, you know, like I interview a lot of artists mm -hmm. and entertainers, and they say, when I first wake up in the morning, I gotta have coffee. Some say I do a smoothie, an mm -hmm. energy drink. Uh, what do you do? First thing I do is drink water. Yeah. Warm water, you know, <laughs> because that's what you're gonna get. I got this from the Africans too. Uh, the first thing is to drink water. Really? Yeah, and then, Tea, if I was there, but here recently I started drinking coffee. Oh, and uh, then from there, I uh, maybe a smoothie, smoothie you know, right. some oatmeal, depends. 
repeated. That's the first thing. Uh, so is there a time of day when, when you create this beautiful artwork that you feel more mm -hmm. comfortable yeah. than well, other times? Yeah. Well, the artwork, I usually, you know, you wake up thinking about something you want to do. Mm -hmm. And so that'd be my, on my mind when I wake up. And so that's what I do. You know, I'm doing, I'll, I'll make a sketch on the canvas or something. And, uh, you know, just because I usually have about four or five paintings going on. And I might decide to work on this one or whichever one I decide. And so that's what I do out there. And when I'm tired of that, <clears throat> I reach a sort of a stalemate where I like it. I go to my computer and check my email and say, and so I write it. I mean, my, like one of my nieces, uh, oh, about 30 years ago, I think she was a girl. And she said, Uncle, you know, you should write a book. And the more the idea struck to me, and I said, well, you know, because, you know, you get to the place where you'd be surprised with how children don't know. It's true. It's true. And you see the lack of pride in people. Uh, they have no idea that. People, that I, well, they knew I lived in Africa every year, but they didn't know the circumstances behind it. But, but that's just the family. Oh, you know, I have a family, they pretty well here. <laughs> you know. yeah. But uh, I was really in the audience here. They had no idea that there was African American living in Africa yeah. before a group, yeah. like the early pioneers. So we don't read about it. We don't read about people that go in there with a screwdriver and a pair of flyers, and two or three years later, they got an electrical manufacturing trick. And so, and he training people how to do that. That's what, you know, most countries want, you know. I see. And so they don't know about it. But there have been a few people that wrote books. And I'll say it again, there's, there was two sisters. I think it was from, one was from California, and then there was another from East Coast, who drove a beat up, yes, across the Sahara Desert. They were social workers, or they sociology. And uh, to Ghana, and wrote a book about their travel and their teaching experience. Uh, there were people who, this was during the time of the group. Okay, uh, I don't want to skip too much. Yeah, but yeah, but, no, <laughs> but that's really interesting. And yeah, well, oh, oh, you and I, we could talk today. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, I had the pleasure of talking with you on the telephone. We must have been on the phone almost an hour. Yeah. Uh, I want to get to now, we also serve African American military. Mm -hmm. And, uh, not only do I have Mr. Curtis Marlowe here, I really must be doing some really something great. I have Miss Lisa Daniel here as well. And uh, I definitely would like to bring her up and take my seat. And so I would like to start with the two of you. I want to know how you came together. This exhibit, as I mentioned, opened in December. Mm -hmm. But before that, Lisa and I actually talked for over a year mm -hmm. uh, regarding bringing uh, a part of her collection here at Anvil. And this, trust me, is doesn't put a dent in Ms. Daniel's collection. Uh, I had the pleasure of seeing most of her collection. And the hardest part that I had curating the exhibit for our space is to stay focused on what I needed to stay focused on because Ms. Daniel's collection is intense and it also became uh, emotional because you're talking about stories. Uh, my, my father was in the military, in the army, and a lot of my family members, so it was very emotional. So I know Ms. Daniels, I, I, I know you weren't expecting this, but I know you're in the audience. So I want to just bring you up. Ms. Daniels, can, can you just come up for a second, my dear? Yes, can you, can you give it a seat here? 
So, so this is this is what I, I really want our audience to kind of uh, understand sort of how you came together with Mr. Morrow. I mean, what, how, how did you, I know you were looking for artwork, uniforms and donations and uh, artifacts. So just tell us how, did the two of you come together? This is a meeting 22 years in the making. So a brief overview of how I started Unsung Heroes. It started off here in the Bay Area. I was attending Chabot College and I was in a creative writing class and my final was to do a biography of someone I knew well, but had to learn about them. And so for me, it was my grandmother, Rita Hernandez. We were very close, she raised me, and I really thought I knew everything about her. So at the time I was doing the assignment, I was living in Richmond, and Graham was living in Fresno, and we talked every day. So I called her up and I said, hey, Graham, you know, I have to do this assignment, and I wanted, I just knew I had to do this assignment about you, but, I'm really uh, at a loss to try to figure out what I don't know about you. And as a matter of fact, Alicia said, like, oh, did I tell you that I was a tack welder and blueprint reader on the Franklin Roosevelt? Wow. Mind you, I'm like 36 <laughs> years old. So I'm, you could just imagine it to my dismay, like, wait a minute, you yes. never told me this. So she talked about how she's first generation American. Her, her parents are from. Trinidad, Tobago, and Puerto Rico. And she talked about how she wanted to get a job and she found a job at the Brooklyn Naval Yard. And she had to kind of do some creative writing, if you will, to get permission from sure. her great grandpa, mm -hmm. my great grandfather, to go to the Brooklyn Naval Yard and get a job. And so when she talked about her story and how that led to her being one of the first women of color and women retail organizers in Brooklyn. I'm like, this is great. I gotta learn more about blacks in the military, whether it's a civilian or if it's an enlisted person. And I couldn't find anything. And this was in two, 2000. So at that time, the only way I could uh, communicate was good old, good old AOL. Mm -hmm. And also uh, they used to have those uh, BBS boards where you would go and put it out, you know, like, like a one a like electronic one. And so I was looking for uh, veterans to tell their story. And Curtis was on AOL. Oh. He sent me a mess. He sent me an email. This was like a 2000. And we kept in contact. So, but this is the very first time we're actually meeting. Oh, really? Yes. I thought you had met before. This is the first time in person we have met. In person? Yes. Wow, so we're, uh, I have waited for this day. This is very special. <laughs> so I'm not getting a little, a little emotional now. But, yes. uh, we talked often about trying to get his work into an exhibit, and things some, something always happened. Whether it was I couldn't get the funding for the exhibit, or I couldn't get the funding to uh, get his work shipped, or to get him here, and uh, Unsung Heroes was blessed with a grant from California Arts Council. Mm -hmm. And we're also blessed with a grant from California Humanities, the NEH grant as part of the uh, Recovery Act for, for the pandemic. So when I knew, when I found out, when we had talked, as you mentioned, we had talked for a while about getting this exhibit here in mm -hmm. Oakland because the rich. Uh, military history here, the pandemic came and we were just at a loss because yeah. for so many reasons. So when Vita mentioned we're going to try and do something virtual, fine. I just started sending things to it. It's like, like containers of uniforms and containers of uh, frame photos. And when I found out that it, the exhibit was a go, First person I thought of was, was Curtis Morrow. Yes. His work is just so exemplary and he 
I've, I've never seen anything like it. And just the love and emotion he puts in his work. I was just like, it's happening this time. So uh, he sent his, his uh, paintings here to Amlo and I was so thrilled. And I saw them on the wall when I came, New Year's Eve of 2021. And I got very emotional because my children were here and they got to see it as well. And now you're here and I'm just, so I, I just can't tell you. And it also, the support system you have here in the Bay Area, the, the people who are here who love you and support you here are here as well. And I'm just so happy you made it. And thank you for, for trusting me to include your work uh, in the exhibit. You. Thank you. Yeah, yeah this is, is really, I know it must be extremely emotional for you. It's uh, very emotional for me. I mean, I, you know, just just seeing him in person and uh, watching him, uh, the, his videos and and going through some of his his books and it is, you know, I'm 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 sitting there and I'm talking to him and I'm realizing he's actually here right in front of me. So it's like it, it is very emotional and. Um, but Mr. Morrow, just just tell us, you know, the being in the military, uh, what branch of service were were you in? Well, I'm, I I was in the Army, the U.S. Army, and uh, I joined in at the age of seventeen from Chicago. No, I joined in Michigan. We were living in with my mother. My father had been peace. In 1948, and uh, so she was a single mother for seven. <laughs> I'm the seven. I was the, I'm the first. And what happened? You know, we have a pretty difficult time. A single mother with seven children and seven. we often moved. So I convinced her to sign for me to join now. I could help. That's what. You know, my story really just represents one out of me because in the army, the unit that I joined was the 24th Infantry Regiment, which mm -hmm. was the last unit of the original bus. Oh, so that's right. Yeah. But we didn't know anything about bus so we just that. I never knew. Someone might, might have mentioned it, you know, some of the older soldiers, soldiers but I don't even remember. I only learned about the history of the Buffalo soldiers after, you know, 20 years after I got out of the service. And so, you know, so I just, uh, what I'm speaking or uh, talking about now represents the other 3,000 men that were there. But we all had this a very similar experience, joining the Army to see the world, you know, that was from our perspective, and also to help our friends, see? And some of them had been from, from the start, Many came from here to in the California area. Matter of fact, some of our leaders, like commanding officers, the West Corner, that came to town, at least two. I mean, not down here, but to our career. And uh, it was those two officers that actually organized the 24th Infantry Regiment Association because we were being left out of history. Because when we go to publish them, they would say, well, look, <laughs> my clientele is not interested in buying books about black soldiers. You know, because their audience was quotation. So they have to, you know, publish it, print what and distribute what they're going to benefit. So one of the brothers here, uh, officers here, Boston, and Kirk Pala, they were both from. Uh, when they noticed that I was, you know, interested in trying to write, so they started sending me information and encouraging me. And I, look, I'm an eighth grade dropout. So I didn't care much about writing a book. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not trying to make drills. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that guy called him, you know, one of my a family members said, Uncle, you know, you should write a book. This thing keeps slipping down. But, uh, so I decided, you know, she's got an idea because I had a nephew who was on his way to Korea and the family, no one in my family knew what Korea was. They thought it was a city. And I said, 
you know, I made a remark, but one thing that, uh, and that's when she suggested that, well, Uncle, you know, you never talk about this. You don't know nothing about this. And she's a high school graduate at the time. So that encouraged me to tell my story, which is difficult because I never told them stories about how life was with a soldier. And this is with any soldier that in combat. And especially during those times, because we had two fights. We was fighting with weapons in the, you know, in combat, and without weapons, <laughs> you know, wow. when we returned. Okay, and especially the guys that returned, you know, lived in the south, southern state. So we had we dealt with all of that. And once there, you know, you you realize that you're fighting for your life. I'm probably going way past your question, but you know. <laughs> but anyway, no, that's, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, I have So I ended up in Korea with the. Uh, I noticed the first thing I noticed that we were all black. You know, we were taking basic training, we were mixed, and uh, until we landed in Incheon. Excuse and me. They started well, calling well, names. In know. basic training, it was just all blacks. You, you are were with everyone else well, in your basic training it was all blacks <clears throat> or was it that was when the army began to integrate the basic training oh so I it see. was mixed in fact okay. there was about 10 or 12 black in my basic training you know unit which was in Fort Valley so you know finished basic training after 14 months and from there to uh Fort Belfast Virginia for an engineering training. So there's only so much that was open for a, a high school dropout. And mm -hmm. one of them was uh, engineering, which was booby trap and ground mining. Lead. <laughs> well, I began, that was a nine months. Before. So I began to have doubts on that after the first month. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, I can understand you know, why. I said, no, I don't think so. But I would have gone through with it, but the war in Korea started. But it wasn't called a war, it was called police act. So I said, well, hey, that's cool. You know, so everybody, everyone that was in that class decided that that's cool. They give us a chance to travel to Japan, the Orient, you know, and have some fun. And, you know, it's just a police action. So our main concern, one of our main concerns was it'll be over by the time we got there. Which mm -hmm. meant I cut loose, I cut short my leave home for about 40 years. You know? And, uh, you know, anxious to get there from there to California and then from here to Camp Stone, I think. Yeah, Camp Stone. And from there to uh, Anchor. And that's what's when the separation began at the dock. And it's, you know, sending a uh, replacement to a different unit. At that time, the, <clears throat> the Chinese had entered the war. And so the United Nations troops was in full retreat. I mean, there was like <clears throat> ants. Uh, you know, it was like, you got to really develop an attitude to survive. So all soldiers in a combat situation develop attitude. You say we see it in the police, you know, because a lot of police are in the service and they have military things. So you develop an attitude. It's you and them. You know, it shouldn't be like that here. You know, it's yeah. but that's the training that they got, right? So, but there is very serious because they want to live as much as, as much as you. You know, they want to go home just like they want to live. But our advantage was we had superiority in weapons, air power, and sea power, which is the only reason that I'm able to sit here and talk to you, uh, this audience today, because they were, everybody was warring. Like in war, everybody is war. And even the civilians, you know, they're the ones who really get it. You know, we see that in what's going on now. 
So, mm -hmm. so that's what we have to deal with as 17 year old. The oldest person in my office, really, was 29 years old. That was the company to come in. No, but that didn't what? come in. I think it was the same. But anyway, you, <laughs> you know, that was the eldest one, right? Because, you know, I'm always for young people, 18 to 25, that's the job. Mm -hmm. So that's what we, and the people that we are fighting, they are like 14 years old too, you know, just go through the village and round up people say, okay, you're going to either be a laborer or you're going to be kind of right. So we see that in all water. But those things are not discussed, you know, when we get to it. And we don't talk about it because it's really hard. It's hard to do something like that. Because I know the real significance. Can I stand up? Yeah, yes, please do. And that was my next question. Well, it was about the, these yeah, two paintings. Yes. Okay, yes. The here, this is what we call a rice paddy. You know, you got to cross the rice paddy. And you got to get all the way to the air paddy. The great thing that there is in here. You know, that's the top of this mountain. So you got to get here and the Indians on the mountain doing it. And they're doing everything to prevent them from getting there because if you get there, they're finished. Right? And that's the mountain. So the one that survived the rice patch, you got to go up those mountains. Now they, the enemies can steal because they've been fighting for since, you know, all the way back. Most of the time, you know, because it is the same thing. All the way up to now. So, and so they have tunnels dug in the mountains, like the train tunnels. So they come out and they give the allowing you to get a uh, uh, halfway up the uh, street. But most of the time, halfway up. So they start moving down. You gotta move. You don't stop pick up. You know, because that's taking you out of the house. So, you know, with this one here, this is like, I remember my, one of my home, well, actually, I do know, in the first uh, world war. And uh, they never, I don't recall humans, but they caught it from, you know, from the other, the white folks. You know, they had a different, you know, racist on Facebook. And uh, so, the one would tell a story. But he didn't really go into detail, you know. But at the same time, he told us to, and, you know, just like a lot of grandparents do. But a lot of our grandparents don't like talking about those days, you know. That's true. Yeah. So he goes out, you know, so it just gets lost. Too. So what happens is, at the same time, he talks about this experience, and here, you know, this here is the Somebody got planning something, you know, to get a job. I wouldn't 
will stay down here if I was. But the black soldier, well, that's his home in yeah, most cases. So, so at, at the same time, then we have to fight this right, fight here without weapons. But if you're a military, you know, any military person that has served in the military, you know, before you can take part in the civil rights struggle, like the freedom march, you got to go to a field of training because you can show no resistance. And that's what they are waiting for. It don't take for, for one person to raise up and fight back or kick a dog or whatever. And so they can use it as a weapon. And the media. So all that information is concealed, but it's really available due to the availability of social media. It just oh, so okay. happened that I'm the I got through about the internet. And when it first came out, I think my first computer was uh, after two C or something, you know, he posts about twenty nine minutes about it, right? <laughs> so, uh, but I just stay here. It could have been about my artistic, you know, not. So we always experiment, you know, looking different ways of doing things. So I got into that, and uh, yeah, you know, during the uh, president. Uh, VFW, when I started the book, the book was because uh, it took three years to write the book because you stop, it's very, it's an emotional thing. So you got to decide what uh, your truth there to be. So there's something you don't tell, you know, like every story, this applies to every story. This is your first book? This is the first one. The first one. No, this well, well, the first was, one was, was the first one. Was when I went there. That was like a college, a university, going to Canada in 1969 to be a freedom fighter. That was the bottom line. I went there. Most of the African Americans that came there, they went there to take part in the struggle. Whatever category they could take, you know, educated and more educated, you know, they have a bunch of knowing. You know, and well, I think we're doing good. And so, uh, you know, it's like going into an area with a screwdriver and a pair of flowers and setting up a manufacturing firm. <laughs> and uh, I thought it you know, was here. So that was uh, in life out there. I was meant to commit. You know, she did all different stuff. So, down there. From secondary, I think from secondary up to college. And so, when the government, the Kuma government, was overthrown, you know, he, then we had a chart. You could either remain there, but you got to be secure stuff. And, uh, make, uh, you know, you got to be, you got to be honest. And so that's what I, I got to do. Um, so, you're, uh, people saw, you know, black people get out of uh, painting, yeah. So, and that was from the suggestion of the dynamic. And so anyway, I became a ghost. The skill that I learned there, I would, uh, the skill that I learned there, I uh, applied that knowledge to, uh, when I returned from Ghana to uh, model making, you know, for Jewish, the most fantastic for manufacturing Jewish. So I was able to earn a good deal, you know, over there and travel around the you know, that I never would have done if I hadn't stepped outside the box, you know. Um, yeah. So I'm going on and on here. No, no, but, no. <laughs> What I like about this painting is it, it makes you think the one to your left because it, it really depicts, especially the bottom uh -huh. one on the, on the left, especially right here where it literally is talking about fighting on two fronts because you're seeing what you have to endure and how you talk about how you have your how you have to take your mindset in order to survive.
spot, and this is really a felt unit. There were a lot of soldiers, as you mentioned, that came home, and a lot of them were hung in, in their uniforms. And so when you see this, it's very compelling to see how you depict and how you see this in the sense of felt in our society. So the fifth world woman Trump refers to such all war because we are in. Because you know, I learned there that it's the nature of it. It's the nature of it. Because that's how we became the greatest country. I was the richest country or how can you want to turn? Because somebody came here and took it. And then you make laws to protect what you get. But you leave out certain people. And so they here now. They have to prove that they are men and women, but yeah, you know, I think that people remember. Yes. Uh, now, those people, that, they got the time to go over there. Then we have the military to protect them. Uh, that's my God, I think we have a you know. So those are some of the things that I found since I started it, this is my really. You know, change, uh, you know, how it's better. But, I mean, people just have, we just the struggle that's still going on. But it's been neglected because nobody has, I guess, my future to figure that out. You know, or it's been ignored because well, people say, well, I don't want to be, you know, reading about that. I don't want to be about that. It could be also because it hasn't been authentic. Yeah, before we write a book, it has to go to be approved. It's like history. When you are teaching history, you teach what you were taught to teach. So unless you get specifically about history, because history is not fair. You know, so all those things you came to mind, you know, as you were writing, you know, and for this to book, you know. What was some of the things that you used when, as you wrote? What were some of the motivators? Because especially with your first book, when, when you sat down to write, did you have a certain space you used? Were you, and how did you gather your thoughts as you're writing? You mean the Korean book or the? Uh, your yeah. your your the your uh, Bison and Coco when you first? Yeah, well, it was about. just you know, that was a good one, a fun one too, because you know, the whole thing was a learning experience. And survival. And by being in another country, our motherland, it was it, that, that 11 years was really a big issue for me. And for all of us, there was that. Because you have to learn the custom of another piece, another group of people, you know, another people. That was the most important in the language, but the custom was really the most important. And uh, so, you know, putting all that together, it was really, it was a fantastic thing. Like I promised my parents, my mother, that the only way I would come back is I got a young or she got it. And so I did, I did you know, mm -hmm. maybe some little small stuff I speak of. And for my mother, she just went to sleep to and wake up. So that's when I, uh, you know, that's when I thought, yeah, I was there. Do you listen to certain music as you were writing? Did you, what was, was yeah. that? Oh, yeah. yeah. What, oh. What, what was your playlist like? If it, what was on your playlist when you were writing? Oh, for this one here, it was like a uh, highlight, you know, dance music, African drums and music. There would always be a stimulating you know, background. You know, I always had music. Yes. Right. And, uh, so that would be, that's what, that was my main inspiration, you know, the stimulation. Because it's a, you know, right, the book too is sort of a only thing that you know with yourself. You, you gotta be you focused. And I've always been good at focusing, you know. I guess most artists are writing. I would think so because you're a painter, so you have to focus as you're right. developing your art, but also jewelry making you oh, definitely. you very you have to have a steady hand, right. but you really yeah. have to focus. Mm -hmm. So if they got if you got two or three things going on, 
that's even better because you get tired of doing this or uh, we're sitting there one day and then we eat and go and do something else. And in fact, a breath control too was a big help too. That's, you know, in everything you do. So, uh, and that was came to me, you know, probably that's what Asians do. Most of after, you know, uh, that experience of being in Japan for two years after Korea, that was, that was very great. I got a chance to, uh, you know, to get interested in the culture, the Japanese culture there. Uh, so I have a question. I know you're also a photographer, and it was somebody uh, that you, uh, it looks like you chronicled their journey Politician. Can yeah, you talk about yeah. that politician in the in the book uh, that you mm -hmm. compiled about this politician we may know? Yeah. <laughs> Obama. <laughs> you know, when Obama, you know, he comes to college. Yes. So Obama, when he ran for president, uh, first, you know, politicians always come to the local news media, you know, they like the weekly, you know, to get their foot. In the door, uh, uh, you know, and so they come to me. Uh, and I happen to, uh, I'm still doing my jewelry, too, but uh, actually, this was around 24, 200, uh, 2004. Okay. And so, uh, I don't know, a publisher asked me if I would take some pictures for that weekly newspaper. And so I said, yeah, that sounds great, you know, because I was always trying to take pictures. So he schooled me. It, the name of that people was the Crusader, Chicago Crusader to come out once a week. And then that's, you know, several other little weekly newspaper. And uh, but watch the politician, you know, once they can get their foot in here, they're gonna try to get as much for their buck and they go to the local, you know, the national and you know, they have to keep that momentum going. Right. So that's how. So I took a lot of photos of Obama when he was running, starting with state center up to Senate and even president. So I just put those together and, uh, you know, and just, you know, compile them up. Because you have, you have photos from 04 all the way to the opening of the African American yeah. Museum in Washington, D.C. So that's 12 years of chronicling. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. And so uh, we, you know, members in our chapter there is when the grand opening occurred, you know, me and uh, 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 we, we just lost him a couple of weeks ago oh, last month. He was, we decided let's go there for the grand opening. So we went, and I'm, you know, I always take it. So I got a lot of them. Actually, I didn't put them all here. I think it's about 200. I probably could have did more on the description. You know, description. I figured like this, you know, this is for my too. Well, I think also, a lot of times with books, like picture books or coffee table books, sometimes if you don't write the description, I think that brings a lot of uh, opportunities for a rich, rich conversation about mm -hmm. this description. When you're talking, you, they're, they're starting a conversation because you're talking about what they see mm -hmm. in the picture. So I think no caption is very powerful too. So yeah. what's the, what are the names of your well, this one here, is the name of this here is, I just named this one, Obama History. But it comes on the two titles. The second book, I have another one, Obama's Journey to the White House. Yeah. So, you know, that's the title. Anyway, all of them is on Amazon. What is it? What is this? It's My Sankofa. And My Sankofa. Uh, what's the comedy of a dance of black people? And uh, well, those are the two books, the books. And then there's several other like picture books. But anyway, I can find them because you just go to YouTube, you know, put my name out. Either that or they can go to Amazon and write, you know, my name, Curtis Morrow, or Curtis J. Morrow, or Curtis J. 
you know, any long hair on the face in the Middle East, but and you'll find them. About seven of them. Uh, that is another way or reason I got into writing is because uh, I've been a very active guy, you know, uh, you know, school. I've been very active in my life. So I got to think about what the heck am I going to do when I retire? What am I going to do? Matter of fact, one of my nieces asked me, Uncle, what are you going to do when you when you get 65? And, you know, naturally you think about it. Like, I don't want to sit, I don't know what I would do. It kind of was, it was a concern. So that encouraged me to write. You know, people really, like, every now and then someone wants you to tell you, tell them something that you did, you know, about how you went about it. And young people, it's really, that was another encouragement. We used to speak, go around speaking to school, university. Yeah, they just want to hear our experience as a private. Uh, we're not encouraging other people. You no know one should drop out. One of the worst mistakes I made, well, it was a mistake, I say now. I should have finished at least high school. I would have been better prepared. But if I could, if I had finished high school, I would have missed career. Which <laughs> I don't mind missing that part. You know? But it just things happen, you know, like I guess your life is just laid out. And so uh, but our younger generation, they really interested in what we did. And they get so far, especially like from the eighth grade, I've been called upon, you know, in Chicago. And Arkansas, not Georgia, that's another state. They just want to know your student. Whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, or whatever, you know, for somebody, the average person that the world depends on is the, the, the common worker, you know, like the people who park your cars or custodial labor. I mean, those are the people that every, the, the rich and the well to do depend on. But they, and they all have a story. And sometimes we can see them sitting on the corner, you know, with a veteran sign on them, you know, because we don't know their story. And then, you know, the military, hell, you know, they go around questioning them, you know, because they, they're not aware of things, or maybe they just lost, you know, while they was in the, you don't know, they could have been a, a frontline soldier, uh, Prisoner war, we don't know. Uh, and that could be a lot of, you know, activities and things that they can do, but they're just not aware of it, uh, you know, whatever. So they have, the bottom line there is they have a story. And so that story can help others. You know, it helped me because I recall when I was nine years old, I would tell, you know, the older people would ask you, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I would say, oh, I want to be an artist. That was my thing. They said, oh, Sonny, you couldn't make a living as an artist. I mean, what do you want to do to earn a living? You know, you got to be something else. And uh, so it got to the point that everything I would say I wanted to do, this I could do. Until this gentleman, I never forget his name. Mr. Ross, he was a poor man poet. And every time he comes to Chicago, he was room with my uncle, one of my uncles. And he would tell us kids stories about his trip. You know, poor man poet was really catching me, right? In the southern state, they have to stay out of sight because people will shoot at them. If they see a black face, they just, you know, on, it was fun to them, you know, shoot, shoot the fellow face. So he, you know, he had to tell us our story. And on one of his trips, he gave me a book by Matthew Henson, The Explorer. And that book, it, the title was Dark Companion. Yeah. And I read that book and I said, damn, that's what I'm going to do. I'll be a soldier. That'll give me a chance to travel, you know. Bro. That was during the Second World War. During the Army, see the world, you know, blah, blah, this and that. So that was my inspiration. So I just set my mind. I couldn't wait until I got 16 or 17. I have yeah. a question for you, Carl. As yeah. being a member of 24, 
and we now call that pretty much the bubble diploma. I'm sure you had a lot of experiences that really just made a mark in your mind. Can you share with us an experience that you know that you probably in this day and age, you would not mind speaking of it. Perhaps when you got out of the military, you wouldn't want to speak of it. Can you share? No, I don't have any, I have some regret of incidents, you mean the, the incidents? Yes. While I was in and while I yes. after I got out. No, while you were in. Yeah, while I was in. Oh yeah, I have some, you know, something that like it's usually like accidental. In the army, in the combat zone, you know, they call it like short round. Like if you're an artillery and you were firing from seven miles behind the line, right? And your target is say twelve miles. Some of those rounds are going to fall short because of the power or whatever. And that short round could fall right on you, on your position. Usually on the civilian. And you got to go through that area and your unit begins to move. And you see little baby crawling over the body, charred up, looking, looking for their pain. You know, now, and the same thing applies when our fighter gets it. Sometimes they were mistaken up. You know, the, uh, their own people, the truth, and shoot us up. And that's a heck of a thing to look up there in one moment, seeing the pain, everybody stand up there waving. You know, they do a bear road and come back, and you see trees, and you know, right? And you, you know, first thing you do, of course, you hit the ground. And then, you know, that's another one. That's, that's quite a few, really, because usually uh, when the enemy attack, they usually attack at night because they couldn't attack during the day, you know, because we have the air power. So just like what we see now, like Russia is doing it. And, uh, So what, they get right up on, they crawl up their heels and they get as about as close as you to that as Charleston <laughs> with the white people that come into you. Well, maybe not quite, you know, they get right up on you before you actually see. That's that's And that's so, close. you know, <laughs> that is that's... something that you, so you really, uh, it's hard to explain, really, the feeling. And the regret can come in, well, you know, you feel jubilated when you manage to fight a right, okay? But then the next morning at daybreak, just see the, the body. 